All right, we are recording for diet and nutrition. So starting with the nutritional exam and assessment, we're gonna take a look at the four components of the nutritional assessment and the nutritional exam. However, I do wanna show you the required text is the human nutrition. This is also used again in your clinical nutrition class. So if you do invest in it, you will definitely get your use out of it. I also uh, prefer myself, if you are into nutritional biochem and very heavy on the science, nutrition, the biochemical pathway side, this is my holy grail. This is what I use uh, extensively. And uh, you can order it on Amazon, on a Kindle. You can also get it as a, uh, as a rent. You can rent it, I think, for like $15 for like a five month period to test it out to see if you like it. But uh, I, use, I use this extensively. I absolutely love this book. I know Dr. Martin used it uh, in some of the earlier biochem classes as well. All right, so the four components. So the first one we're going to address here, what are the four components of the nutritional assessment? They are these four right here. We have a dietary, anthropometric, biochemical, and functional clinical status assessment. If we take a look at some of these, the dietary assessment is going to be part of what we're looking for. So I do want you to know the three ways. What are the three ways that we can look for a dietary <laughs> assessment? And these are super common in our uh, in, in nutritional uh, evaluations. So as a chiropractic nutritionist, we want to still be taking into account, you know, the, the conservative care and primary care exams that we are taught, heart, lung, you know, abdomen, uh, head and neck, head to toe, those are all still important. However, different docs can choose to use a musculoskeletal component or not. However, when we're focusing on the nutritional exam itself, these are the four things that we want to look at uh, and, and assess. So we have three ways. The dietary assessment is either going to be the three-day or a seven-day food diary, a 24-hour recall, and then the meal input app. So those are some of the top ways that the industry is using the ability to diet, assess dietary uh, intake. And the important thing with that is going to be that different, different apps and different um, write-outs, this is the CDCs, as I had mentioned, uh, this is included on Signet, and then here's one that I modified. I uploaded for you that as well. I recommend no less than a three day, and you'll see the alternative is a uh, is a food recall. The food re the 24 hour recall is going to be a little bit of an issue, right? So, so what are some pros and cons of dietary assessment? Some of the pros and cons are going to be that. Some people, and I have absolutely seen this in my practice. They don't tell me the truth, right? They don't want to disappoint you. They don't want you to have pass judgment on them. So it's really important to let them know this is a safe place, that there's no judgment. I'm here to help you. And if you're not honest with me, I can't fully help you. So sometimes there's a little bit of a barrier. So one of the cons of the dietary assessment is honesty and uh, you know full disclosure from the patient. The other pro versus con is that sometimes people have poor recall. Right? If we're doing a three-day diary and a seven-day diary, and if the person is not compliant with writing it down right at that meal, if they're seven days in, they're like, oh crap, I've got my appointment with my doc. I better get something on paper. She's going to want it. They're going to be like, yeah, sure, I had a salad on Tuesday. Mm -hmm, yeah, that cheeseburger, that, that sounded like last Tuesday, right? So a little bit of a, the, the memory recall as well as the disclosure. However, when you, when you do use these, it's, it can be very valuable because we have to assess the combination of dietary and lifestyle uh, integrated habits. Many people think they eat healthy, but they don't realize that what healthy is. That's why I really like the term intelligent eating, where we're eating for the purpose of supporting biochemical and uh, pathways that support optimal physiological functioning. But most people don't know that. If you have nothing but of three pieces of iceberg lettuce and call that your side salad, that's not going to really qualify as your full like greens, right? That's not going to cut it. But a lot of people think if they have one side salad at lunch, that that's enough for their vegetable intake for the day. And again, 
uh, we're going to learn some strategies because that's not necessarily going to be suffice. Uh, when we're analyzing symptoms, in addition to dietary and lifestyle changes, we will many times be using these food diaries. And you're going to see on my nutritional, what I incorporated was a section and I do ask you to uh, fill out the uh, nutritional portion of the new patient intake so that you can see how I'm challenging the patient on their intake to tell me that they can identify certain vegetables and produce. If somebody doesn't know what a fiber is, how are they going to go buy it if I tell them incorporate more fiber, right? If somebody doesn't know what Swiss chard is versus kale versus bok choy, and if they don't know what arugula is versus romaine, how am I going to come up with a dietary uh, strategy to help them shop and change their eating habits? They don't even know what the stuff is, right? How many people are going to come to us with goals of nutritional improvement? I want to lose weight. I want to have my medications. I'm training for an event. I'm getting married. You know, whatever their case is, they have to know what these things are. So the dietary intake, as you're going to see, is a really great way for me to, uh, to challenge what it looks like. So one of the things that I did when I modified the uh, dietary intake uh, form was I included this section of symptoms. Most people have symptoms. They're coming to see us not just for the purpose of, oh, I just want to lose weight or I want off my meds. Most people don't feel good. Something's wrong, right? Do you get hives every time you eat? Do you have bloating? Do you have uh, osmotic diarrhea? Do you eat something and then a few days later uh, you break out, right? So what I like to do is when you eat it, what did you feel? And this is important because when we begin to incorporate supplementation, whether it's a diet, whether it's a digestive enzyme or it's uh, a chewing habit, if we're substituting uh, different foods, we need to make sure that they're going to react well. I will tell you certain patients are super sensitive. Super sensitive means that the normal person who can have uh, maybe two to three, maybe even five supplements introduced with the dietary and lifestyle changes, the average person would do great. They're gonna feel better within seven to 14 days. By the end of three months, they're, they're, they're doing phenomenal. Then you've got the patient who's got a whole bunch of stuff going on and they're sensitive. Everything makes them sick. Everything makes them nauseous. Every time uh, I took that supplement, which is great for everybody else, I felt fatigued for three days. So somebody who is sensitive, we need to wean them down. We take, we, we decrease the dose. We decrease how many things we're doing at the same time. And we simplify it one thing at a time, get them seven to 14 days doing good without it. Then you introduce one more. That is really important in this because now we can track it. Let's find which one you didn't do good with. Let's find which one we need to focus on first. It helps us get the IRB. So when we do a food diet, a food diet uh, intake, it really helps us to add that emotional and or symptomatic side, which is why I adapted that one. When you do your assignment for the uh, dietary uh, three-day in intake, you can choose either one. You can use the CDC, I'm not mandating. Take a look at both. Feel which one you think would be, you know, more keen to your interest. Uh, but you can use this one or the uh, CDC that I uh, uploaded. All right, let's see. Memory recall. So anthropometric. So what does this measure and what are the five ways? What this is measuring, an anthropometric is going to be looking at the body habitus. When you are writing up a soap note and you have to describe what you observe, right? As doctors, we have to push and pull, but we also have to start with C. What do we see? If I'm uh, measuring a patient's uh, you know, stature, we don't want to use offensive words. So we want to use words like tall and lean or uh, stout, a body habitus of uh, obesity. We don't, wanna, we don't wanna use offensive words like thin and fat. So lean, muscular, uh, overweight, uh, uh, abdominal obesity, those are some of the keywords that we can use. And when we're using the nutritional assessment anthropometric, body habitus is what I like to use. Uh, patient presents with a body habitus of. Uh, 
Patient has a goal of decreasing body habitus of. Patient has a goal of attaining a body habitus of. Lean muscular, uh, uh, do they want to tone? Do they want to lose weight? And the five ways that we can measure these, so know these right here. So these are the five ways. The BMI chart, we can do the height and weight, the waist to hip ratio, the skin fold thickness test, and my favorite, the bioimpedance scale. So the most expensive one, of course, is the bioimpedance scale because you have to actually purchase uh, the device. However, uh, they're getting away from BMI. They're saying that there are cases where, you know, you have a CrossFit athlete. CrossFit athlete is gonna be thicker, right? But they're muscular. And they're going to come up with a higher BMI. I had a tall, lean gentleman. He was in, in his late 40s, six foot three, lean and muscular. He had a little bit of abdominal adipose, and it gave him a BMI that was very high. That's negative because that gets in his head. You know, he wanted to lose about 10 pounds, and he looked great as he did, but that was his goal. Wanted to get rid of a little bit of the, uh, the you know, the abdominal uh, weight. He was lean everywhere else. But when he saw that BMI, you know, he, he left my office like so upset. He's like, I'm fat, right? That's not, a, that's not okay. Uh, and one of the biggest things that we have to do is make sure that we address self-negativity. Self-negativity is so huge when we're talking about nutritional assessments and working with nutritional uh, diets, uh, dietary lifestyles. And we just don't want to get... We want to make sure that we're getting rid of some of those negative thoughts because it can it can very uh, very negatively impact the outcome. So uh, the BMI charts they're starting to get away from. These are a few of the ones that I download. <coughs> you can get them. Uh, you can order them online. You can order them on Amazon. There are carriers if you wanted to post this in your office. A lot of offices who work with nutritional uh, statuses will have these as charts. However, it is very, uh, these are the indices and the ranges, if you will. So below 18.5 is underweight, 18.5 to the 24.9 is normal healthy weight, 25 to 29.9 overweight, and then if you reach 30, then they're going to call that as obese. And again, I, I think that they're starting to shift away from it. However, for simplicity, definitely know that it is still used and it is one of the anthropometric measures. Another one is going to be your height and weight. And again, this is, it, it can be skewed. It's good to document. It's good to, uh, it's good to get baselines. And as you do a new nutritional assessment at you know, after you initiate a treatment plan and some dietary and lifestyle changes, then you can use these to track progress. The other one is waist to hip. Now this one is a little bit more uh, prominent, especially in medical literature. We're gonna learn in several weeks that metabolic syndrome and non-alcoholic fatty liver are some of the pandemics of the obesity and insulin resistance diabetes that we have uh, going on these days. And one of the risk factors of developing insulin resistance, which will progress to diabetes with abdominal obesity is the metabolic syndrome. And one of the qualifiers to be diagnosed with metabolic syndrome is going to be an elevated waist to hip ratio. If you get to greater than one, you're going to have a very, uh, negative response of the visceral adipose as being a hormone generator that is very pro-inflammatory. And it causes a lot of downstream stress on the liver. And we learn that going forward. So in regards to the anthropometric measure, the waist to hip ratio is one of the qualifiers to diagnose the metabolic syndrome. So this is an anthropometric measure that's used uh, quite regularly in cardiovascular disease as well as weight loss. And my favorite is going to be the uh, bioimpedance scale. So the bioimpedance is going to put, you stand on a, a, on a plate and it puts a little bit of a small, I want to say electrical charge, which you don't feel it. And what it's able to do is it analyzes lean body mass, water mass, bone density, fat mass. It gives you weight and it gives you BMI. So the question here is which of the anthropometric measures can give you a bone density readout? Guess what? 
this scale and some of the bioimpedance scales, they come within 3% being as accurate as a uh, DEXA bone scan. So this is a really great analysis in addition to BMI as well as a lean muscle mass and hydration. So here's some information. This is the Tamita scale. And this is what one of the readouts looks like. This is portable. You can take them to other offices. You can take them to events. You can take them to a gym or a, a vitamin store if you were doing a, 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 like a, a, a show, if you will. And this will give you the readouts. So down here is the, the body, uh, body habitus. Here's your bone scans. And then you can see, I know you can't read it very clearly, but you've got BMI, body fat, lean muscle mass, and water mass. What I really like is a lot of patients are dehydrated. And this gives you a nice reading of where you fall. If you're dehydrated, you're gonna have higher blood pressure, you're gonna have more fatigue, and you're gonna have less ability to absorb, potentially even some headaches and some negative, uh, negative outcomes. We definitely learn fluid dynamics, electrolytes, and water balance this semester. However, I really like this scale. So this runs about $1,300, so it's not cheap. However, it's a wonderful uh, tracking method in addition. So every nutrition patient that I worked with, with the new patient exam and initiation, everybody got a reading. And you know what? We didn't do another reading until three months of supplementation, dietary, and lifestyle changes. One of the worst things you can do if you're working with somebody with uh, trying to lose weight is look at the scale every day. Don't do it. It's just, it'll get in your head. And remember, body fluctuates. If you're within a five pound fluctuation up and down and you track that long term, that's just where you are. It's when you start to have big jumps uh, and or big losses that should be more, uh, more concerning. But I definitely recommend if you are working with uh, weight to not manage it and not assess it every day. So that is a cool one. Okay, the other nutrition, there's two more a new nutritional assessments that we're looking at for uh, just to, to wrap up. And then we'll go on to the next, uh, to the next key concept. One of the other very important nutritional assessments is lab work. We are able as conservative care uh, chiropractic physicians to order blood work and lab work you can do saliva for hormones. You can track a female cycle. You can analyze cortisol and adrenal uh, stress response. We can look at all types of blood. We look at, uh, in six try, we do lab diagnosis, and I teach you a lot of ways to read blood work and to help uh, analyze. Because we have an entire class in six try, I don't touch on this too much. However, just know that there's a lot of really cool ways that we can do that we can do blood work and that's part of the nutritional assessment. And then lastly, we're gonna come into this keyword here, subclinical. So as we move forward, what's the, what is subclinical and then how does that correlate to nutrient insufficiency versus deficiency, okay? So one of the last ways that we are assessing is going to be uh, if a patient has symptoms and or a diagnosis that correlates to poor and or non-optimal, again, dietary and lifestyle habits. And you're going to hear me always use those together. All right, so let's take a look at subclinical. This is a wonderful page out of uh, a book written, it's called Functional Perspectives. This is uh, Dr. Lord, he's a medical uh, director of one of the couple of the medical labs. Guy's absolutely brilliant. The only downside is that book is like 800 bucks. <laughs> so uh, I was provided it through one of my master's classes with the University of Bridgeport. So thankfully I have a copy of it. But as you can see in the background, they put a nice big uh, watercolor stamp to make sure that that was, that they knew that that was a, uh, provided one. So when I do some of these pictures, you can see that nice meta metrics back there. But when we're talking about insufficiency and deficiency, this is a very important concept. If you do not have the amount of nutrients that your body needs to optimally, physiologically, and biochemically work, you will have slower wound healing, 
you're going to have more pain, more disease, and more degeneration. You're going to age at a faster rate. When you have the sufficient amount of nutrients that support biochemical pathways, because everything in the body is going to be a communication, and everything that requires turnover and nutritional uh, support is going to either allow it to work or not. The body is brilliant and it has wonderful ways of compensations. So if the body is going to compensate, which it will, it will rob Peter to pay Paul. What that means is what tissue and what organ system is going to get taken from in order to satisfy a higher priority status. And this is important in the concept of this pandemic. Think about these individuals who become more sick versus less sick. Some people have COVID and they don't even know they have it. And then some people are extremely ill and some actually have end mortality, right? It can be fatal to some people. And they've studied this extensively. And a lot of the, new, a lot of the science has supported comorbidities and nutritional status. Individuals that supplemented with some of the very simple things that we learn, and acetylcysteine supplies some sulfur and some glutathione, zinc and vitamin D to support the immune system, vitamin C is an antioxidant, selenium to support, again, some of the glutathione peroxidase and oxidative stress from the cytokine storms. When the nutrients of the micronutrient vitamin and mineral category were provided at higher levels, disease and or symptoms were supported to be less intense and to be less long, right? How long did it last? How bad was it? If you have the nutritional supplementation, which is going to provide the body the ability to do what it needs to do on that molecular level, you are going to have a better expression of quality of life. You're going to be able to deal with disease and or preventing and or reversing disease better. So this comes back to this. So what ends up happening is when you have a nutrient deficiency, before you feel it, you already have negative underlying keywords, subclinical uh, occurrences. Subclinical is going to mean that we don't feel it, but it's happening. The worse it gets, the more systems that are going to uh, take the rap, if you will, and have a potential negative outcome uh, as the body compensates. So the worse the nutrient uh, deficiency becomes, the more subclinical compensations. And you're going to go from symptom onset, then you're going to start to have morphological changes. When you start to have <laughs> symptoms and disease, disease expression, at that point, you already are having biochemical, morphological, and structural changes at the tissue and organ level. Remember, so it goes system to organ, organ to tissue, tissue to cell. And then if we take it one step further, beyond the cell, we can look at the molecular occurrences. So we want to talk about a body being systemic, and we want to fix a person at that molecular and tissue level. If we fix the physiological operations of the cell to restore cellular function, the cellular function is going to support the tissue doing better. And when the tissue works, the whole organ system works. And when the organ system works, you have complex dynamic interactions where whole body is working and feeling good. So we want to fix it and support it at the molecular level. Nutrient deficiencies mess everything up on that molecular and cellular level. If it goes on long enough, you're going to end up with outright organ disease and outright disease state. So guess what you do? You reverse it. If we know that a system is breaking down with symptoms and disease, then we're going to down, we're going to look at how can we affect this at the molecular and cellular level. So if I know that somebody is not making enough ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and they are not healing well because they are officially diagnosed with mitochondrial dysfunction, fatigue, slow wound healing, aging, pain, and degeneration. Guess what I want to start to do on that person that's fatigued and not healing fast? I'm going to support ATP. How do I support ATP? We give them the macronutrients. We give them the vitamins and the minerals because all of those on that molecular level, which we talked about in biochem, which we'll review next week, they're going to give us ATP. Simply having somebody be able to heal and repair and regenerate is one of the best ways that you can support conservative care and the, the musculoskeletal and or organic approach 
and you're doing it with this. You're supplying the nutrients so that you can reverse any of the insufficiencies and or subclinical, okay? So one more word right here, insufficiency versus deficiency. Insufficiency is that early state of nutrient loss and or not having it bioavailable that is going to start that subclinical downfall. When you have vitamin insufficiency, you might have like just enough as long as you don't challenge the body. If you all of a sudden try to go run a marathon or try to go to the gym, or if you ended up getting pregnant and all of a sudden the body's demands are accelerated, if you were barely hanging on at that insufficient state, you might be just getting by without feeling symptoms and feeling like you're gonna crash. You, add, you increase the body's demand, all of a sudden, boosh, you're gonna crash, okay? So deficiency is when you are outright, you don't have enough, you're symptomatic, and you're presenting with the diseased state. And we look at a bunch of the uh, amino acid deficiency syndromes as well as uh, mineral and vitamins. In the, in, the, in, the going, in the going weeks. Okay, so let's see. Here is an example uh, before I pop out of the nutritional uh, exam. This is one of my intakes. So you can see I'm asking for vitamins and minerals. And above that, I also ask for medication lists. However, I start to ask, you know, tell me about cooking. Do you cook? Do you know how to cook? Are you willing to cook if I will help teach you to cook, right? If somebody's like, yeah, I need to eat better, are you gonna cook? No, I don't have time, I'm not gonna do it. So I'm not gonna waste my time trying to give them ideas on how to cook. I'm gonna find ways to get the food into them that uh, is going to be something that they would use. Here's a few more uh, examples of just circling back to uh, the asking people about what they know about food. Here's some examples of the questions that I'd like to ask. Again, this is posted so you can take a look at it. And then here's the shopping list. And do you recognize some of these things? And you'd be surprised, people don't know what greens are. Okay, so let's take a look at, any questions on that before we keep going? Oh, did I open them twice? Aha. We'll circle back to that. I uploaded the wrong one. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay, so we'll kind of, we talked about the six categories of intelligent eating on uh, Tuesday. However, we did not make it to meat. Uh, we'll talk about the energy balance and if I have time, we'll get the meat in there. So I'll get the PowerPoint, we'll do it on uh, Tuesday for sure. However, if you just wanna make a note so that it makes a little bit more sense and we can go rapidly go through it next week. Meat is non-exercise thermogenesis activity. Non-exercise thermogenesis activity. And meat is really a very interesting concept. A Dr. James Levine, he's a DC PhD. He was one of the founders of accentuating the importance of meat. And we have all of our activity trackers and the walking devices and the, and the pedometers that we wear on our wrist now because of his research. So meat is the portion of the body's metabolic rate, which is how, the, how we consume energy is ATP to sustain life. When we sit still and do nothing but have our heart pump, and our lungs breathe, and our brain work, and our vasculature, you know, pump our blood. If you sit still and do absolutely nothing, that takes about 66, which is about two thirds of all of the body's expenditure of ATP, basal metabolic rate. If you digest food, it can take anywhere from an increased jump from about five to 15%. 
And what James Levine, Dr. James Levine did studying uh, the, the BMR and the NEAT, non-exercise activity thermogenesis, you only get about 30% of the body's expenditure. When I say the body's expenditure, that is how much consumption of ATP does your body need to simply sustain life? That's not movement. That's not anything else except sit there and breathe. So if you're going to improve how well you burn fat and energy, which means you can eat more and not gain weight, or you can eat less and lose weight, you do that through that 33%, which is NEAT, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So there are some really cool ways. We'll take a look at that again when I get the PowerPoint in. I apologize that I uploaded, I double uploaded the wrong, double uploaded one, which is my fault. So we'll do that next week. However, I think that's a really cool concept because when we're working with weight loss and when we're working with establishing how the body functions, we can use that 33% of Dr. Levine's um, studies with uh, NEAT, non-exercise activity thermogenesis, and we can significantly improve uh, weight loss and body function, which I think is pretty cool. All right, so looking at the important concept of assimilation. So we're going to be doing multiple nutrients. We're going to be learning carb, fat, and protein metabolism. We're going to review how vitamins and minerals function, as well as how they support very important, uh, very important processes. However, none of that matters if you can't get those into the body. So we have to remember digestion. Digestion means that you ate it, but you were able to break it out of the food matrix. Once you break it out of the food matrix and get it down to some of its elemental particle sizes, in the intestines, we then have to absorb it. We have to absorb it out of the lumen of the intestine. If you cannot get it out of the lumen of the intestine, one of two things is going to happen. So if you, right here, where does digestion begin and what happens if, you, if it doesn't work? If you cannot eat it, break it out of the food matrix and absorb it, then what's going to end up happening is of course nutrient deficiency. However, if it stays in the lumen, you either form feces and you lose it to stool or you feed the gut bacteria. So if you can't get nutrients absorbed, meaning out of the intestinal lumen through the enterocyte, the, the cell of the intestines, into the bloodstream, then you're just going to feed the microbiome, which is a good thing if it's a fiber. It's a negative thing if you've already got a dysbiosis and a gut problem. So you also don't wanna pay for supplements and or pay for high-end expensive organic foods if your digestion isn't working, because all you're doing is paying for that nutrient and or that food to either become microbiome and or toilet dinner, right? If you can't get it in, then you're not going to be able to get it into the bloodstream. So when we properly digest and absorb, we call that nutrient assimilation. So what is nutrient assimilation? It is the combination right here. Assimilation requires what? Assimilation is the dual effect of digestion plus absorption. When that appropriately happens and when you have nutrient uh, assimilation, so what does this result with? It results with bioavailability. Bioavailability is when the nutrient is in the bloodstream and it's available to the peripheral tissues for uptake. It's available to the peripheral tissues for uptake. Just like you have to get it into the bloodstream where it comes out of the lumen of the intestines into the enterocyte, crossing it into the bloodstream, the same thing happens at the bloodstream. The bloodstream delivers it to the tissues at the cellular level of exchange. The cell has the ability to take it up so that it can use it in whatever pathway it needs. It could be a synthesis pathway. It could be an anabolic. It could be a catabolic. It could be building energy. It could be for storage. It could be for synthesis. However, nutrient bioavailability is going to rely on dietary assimilation if the food is being ingested, 
And then if you need to increase bioavailability because you're not eating it or because you're not digesting it, guess what? You better be supplementing with it. So what are some things we can do? We talked about the other day. You can support digestion. You can supplement. If it's a category of food you don't eat, you better take a powder, get it in somehow. You also have the option of intramuscular. You can get a shot. You can do intravascular. You can get an IV. There's intravenous feeding. However, there's also Myers cocktails, for example. A lot of nutritional can have an IV. And uh, worst, well, last case, if you must, especially with infants uh, or in severely deficient people, you can even introduce vitamins and minerals rectally. However, of course, we want to first support digestion and then either supplement intramuscular and or IV. So when we are considering where does digestion begin? Digestion actually begins in the mouth because you've got to chew it, mastication, right? And in the mouth, you have a bunch of enzymes. You already have a fat protein, uh, uh, excuse me, a fat uh, enzyme for, for dietary fats. You have an amylase, uh, which is going to begin to start breaking down carbs. And the chewing alone is one of the most important parts because it mechanically breaks up the surface area. If you don't chew well and it reaches the stomach juices, that particle is like an iceberg, right? It, it's a mountain. This tiny little enzyme is trying to die come along and break down the nutrient out of the particle and it's, it, it can't reach it. So proper chewing is going to be where digestion starts. And that's the, one of the basic ways that we can support a bioavailability and nutrient assimilation. So we'll go through all of the organs in diet and nutrition. However, here's a nice reminder of how the digestive system runs in a sequential area. <laughs> and lastly, we have a few keywords here. When we're looking at nutrient bioavailability, a lot of people like to read food labels and it's recommended in a lot of weight loss clinics and trying to work with blood sugar uh, and, and you know get some of the obesity and metabolic syndrome that's out there. And we need to understand how to read the labels and what some of these things mean, right? So a DRI, is going to be the dietary reference intake. That is the minimum amount, mostly of vitamins and minerals to prevent disease. However, it's not always going to be the optimal amount and every person's individual uh, state is going to be uh, important. My personal intake is DRI is not enough. We are in a toxic world. We have overpopulation, we have pesticides, we have, uh, we, pollution and chemicals everywhere. So we have to make sure that we are supporting growth and repair, liver detox, elimination pathways. And a lot of times it's going to be a little bit more than the DRI. RDA is going to be recommended dietary allowance. AI is adequate intake. So know you're be able to identify the, the definition and then your upper tolerable limit. So AI is determined on a vitamin or nutrient if they don't know what the minimum amount is. So for example, we're going to learn chromium and vanadium. Those are considered ultra trace. Those don't have an RDA. However, we know that they serve physiological functions. So instead of an RDA, if we don't know, then we call that an AI. That's an important one. Okay. So if we don't have the, uh, we don't have the RDA, but we know it's still physiologically necessary and serves a, a functional role. We will call it adequate intake if we don't know the exact amount we need. The other important one is your upper tolerable limit. And that's basically going to be how much can you take before it becomes toxic. Some vitamins uh, and minerals, uh, especially like your micro minerals, in high doses, more is not better in several cases. So we don't, we, we need to pay attention to where toxicity can occur. Now, magnesium is kind of an interesting one and we'll kind of, and we'll end on this thought. Magnesium at very high levels can actually have a therapeutic role. It can actually induce, uh, it can have a laxative effect. And for people who have constipation, we can use high dose magnesium. 
So would we call that a toxicity? Theoretically, not everybody wants to have loose stools if they're trying to take their magnesium. However, that's a really cool example where we can use the, uh, the upper limit therapeutically. Okay, any questions? So sorry about the neat uh, PowerPoint. I will get that. We'll start with that next week. <laughs>